Today, what I want to do is we're going to start a series, and I'm just simply calling this series a challenge to you. It's called this, Read Your Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, read your Bible. Read your Bible. So what I want to do in this series is I want to walk through some fundamental principles about what the Bible is, the Word of God. And I want to talk about this. I'm actually, a lot of these notes are coming from um, a book that Pastor Liam, now Pastor Liam oversees Destiny Europe. He wrote a a workbook, um, and we'll have them out available as well to purchase 10 euros. Um, But there's these these workbooks. It's actually called the Bible. He makes a joke. He's like, I wrote the Bible. It's the title of it is the Bible. It's a workbook, but it's getting the most out of God's word. Because maybe some of you have been like me, and when you approached God's word, it can seem intimidating. You like open up Leviticus, and you're like this sacrifice and that sacrifice, and take two steps there or two steps there and then clap your hands and turn around and then sacrifice a dove and you're like what is all this about I don't get the whole religious and legalism to this and you started maybe in the wrong place or maybe you got a translation that's talking about these and thous and you don't talk like that you just like maybe it was very intimidating for you to um, engage with scripture and engage with the bible But what we want to do is we want to give you some foundational things that hopefully will reshape maybe for some of us the way we thought about the Bible. We also want to give throughout this series practical tips on reading the Bible. How do do I study the Bible? How do I even sit down with this? Tip number one is open it, but we'll talk about that later, okay? But there's really practical tips that maybe I've learned, that some other people have learned, that we can pick up and we can help each other in engaging with the Word of God. We're going to talk about the validity of Scripture and um, the foundation on which it stands upon. And so also, really quickly, Um, On the screen, if we could put up the QR code for the loop, I know this isn't in the notes for this, but Put up, put up the QR code for the loop because on there, if you, if you scan this QR code, if you go onto the loop, if you go all the way to the bottom, what you'll find is some resources that I've put together um, because it's, it's links to different Bibles. I literally questioned Pastor Liam and Fiona, and then I wrote my own little blurb. I said, hey, what's your go-to Bible? You know, Because maybe some of you are approaching this for the first time, or maybe you just have a Bible that somebody gave you a long time ago and it's traveled with you. And, but I asked them, I said, What's your go-to Bible? What's the go-to translation for you? So this maybe takes some of the intimidation out. So you can just say, hey, this is what Pastor Liam uses, or this is what Fiona uses, or this is what Pastor Daniel, you know, your favorite pastor. Just get that Bible, and then just follow along with them, and then let me know whose Bible you got. But really, what I did was I just gave a little blurb, kind of why they use that translation, why we use that Bible, and then I've put some links to the European Amazon somebody so that you can buy these Bibles. Bibles if you don't have a Bible. During this whole series, my challenge to you is simple. Just read your Bible. If you would just engage with it, if you would just begin, if you would just start, I believe God will transform your life and do something very significant. So this isn't a New Year's resolution. This is why I didn't do it at the beginning of the year, because I know that you all fail at your New Year's resolutions. So we're doing it right here in the middle. I just challenge you for this next month, month and a half, read your Bible engage with it find a time during your day to engage with the word of God even if you're approaching it and it seems intimidating even if you're approaching it you're like I don't know where to start I don't know what to do just begin and we're going to hopefully equip you throughout this series um, to be able to engage with it and enjoy um, reading the Bible and that it would speak to you um, so we've got the pastor's Bibles on there. There's also just a link, a simple link to you version. If you guys are the techie people and you don't like, you don't want to carry around a physical Bible, you know, you don't want to get one of those zipper cases with some highlighters in it and do your whole thing, then you've got a, you got a you version Bible. There's a link on there as well. There is an app for that, okay? So I encourage you, find a Bible that is best for you um, because if, if you don't know what's in it, if you can't engage with it, if you don't understand maybe the language or the translation, then how are you even going to pick it up and engage with it? So find something that works for you, and let's begin to engage with it. Amen? Well, really quickly, let's dive into John chapter 1, and we'll get started with this series today. John chapter 1, it says this. <clears throat> it talks about, in the very first Um, In in the very first sentences of the book of John, which is one of the four Gospels, 
It's John's description of the coming of Jesus. In other gospel accounts, we see the Christmas story and Jesus' birth. But in John, there's a very unique description of Jesus and how he enters into the world. And it has to do with the Bible. And it has to do with the word of God. It says this, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. So let's just stop right there. At the beginning of Everything was God's word. It, it, this, this wasn't something that was put together by, by scholars. This was, this was God's word at the beginning. Now the Canaan of scripture, that's a whole different story and we're gonna talk about that throughout um, this series. But the, in the beginning was the word. And watch this. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, let me just tell you that this is one of the scriptures um, in Jehovah's Witness is that if you were to read one of their Bibles, it would say, and the word was a God, and the word was a God, and then little g there. And I had great discussions with um, a, a, kind of a friend of mine now who's a Jehovah's Witness, and we talked about this scripture um, and how, it, how it's formed. But if you go back to the text and go back to translations, you see here that it says, and the word was God. So first of all, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Do you notice how, it's, it, how John is talking about the Word of God, not as a thing, but as a him? Through him, in the beginning was the Word, and through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. That has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is, here's what I want to preach to you today. Let me just announce to you the sermon title It's alive. It's alive. Just felt like doing like a Frankenstein thing. It's alive. We could have done some sound effects with lightning, you know. It's alive. It's alive. The word of God in John is referenced as a hymn. He's talking about it. I think it's kind of interesting that we just got done with a series. I didn't plan this, and I just thought about this this morning as I was preparing. We just got done with a series talking about Holy Spirit. Now what we're doing is we're talking about the word, who is Jesus. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh on this earth. He walked this earth. And we talked about the whole, we talked about Holy Spirit. We talked about Jesus. We talk, we're talking in two different series back to back, zeroing in two persons of the Trinity. The Father, the Son who is the word of God, and Holy Spirit. So we're zeroing in on the word. Let me just tell you, for me, this is, uh, I brought this today because while I was visiting the U.S., I found this in a box. This Bible right here with my name in silver, Daniel Patrick McGuire, this was given to me um, by my mom right before high school. I know this because August 2003, Jill McGuire, shout out mom if you're watching online, and she says this, your take, she writes this in my Bible and she gives this to me before I go to high school. She says, you're taking the next step in life by beginning high school. Woo! High school musical. May you find encouragement and guidance in these words. Love, Mom. I thought that was a pretty cool gift, wasn't it? That my mom would be so intentional to write in a Bible, select a Bible with my name on it, and give it to me right before I step into high school, which in the U.S. is a very big step. It's sometimes scary um, and very intimidating. Here's the problem, and I'm sorry to say this, Mom, um, but I don't know if from the point that she gave me this to the point I gave my life to the Lord that I actually ever read it. This Bible went with me um, wherever I went. I moved. I went to high school. It sat there on my bedside table collecting dust. Sometimes if I wanted to look less Christian or spiritual to my friends who were coming over, I'd tuck it in the drawer underneath. 
but it would always sit there on my bedside table and I was out partying on the weekend and just doing all kinds of other stuff that I shouldn't be doing. Um, and we could talk about that and I'll tell you my testimony a whole nother time. In fact, I'm going to Munich on the 31st. It won't be here. And I'm sharing my testimony. That's what they asked me to do. And so they said, from prison to pastor, that's what they're titling it. I wasn't in prison. I don't know why they're going to title it that. I told them, no, don't do that. So this Bible, literally, while I was... Um, while I was a heathen, you know, that's what they say in the dirty south. When I was a heathen, I had this Bible. It went on with me. And, and I finally, I moved out of my parents' house, moved out. I got my own place. And this was freedom, man. I was having parties over at my house all the time. We were just having girls over there all the time. And this Bible went with me when I packed my one little, uh, this is how bachelors do when you move out of the house for the very first time. It was just one little bag of stuff. And that moved with me, you know, when I, pa I packed the Bible in there. I don't know why, but maybe some of you can identify with it because it's, it was kind of like you kind of feel bad you know it's kind of like the the toy the toy story dynamic right it's the it's the little it's the little stuffed animal or the blanket you had as a kid that you're really not sure when to get rid of it because like uh like you feel bad tucking it in a box anybody know what i'm talking about like that thing is sitting in an attic it's collecting dust and now that i'm talking about it you're like i gotta go find that mom you're like texting your mom where is that because you feel bad because Toy Story came out and made toys alive, and you're all of a sudden thinking, oh no, I feel really bad because Woody's sitting in a closet now. And it was kind of like that because this kind of, I, I don't want to just give it away or throw it away or lose it, so it's going to come with me. And so I'm going to put it on my bedside table because also maybe you can identify with the fact that maybe it's a good luck charm, you know. If I set it there, nothing's going to happen. But if I leave it at home, maybe God's going to spite me, you know. Like I'm going to have God's favor if the Bible sits next to me, you know. And the Bible was sitting there in my, in my drawer, in my bedside table, all while I'm doing things that thou shalt not be spoken of. And I'm over here partying in my house, and I'm out here living for myself and doing all this. And this Bible sat there as if it was a good luck charm, collecting dust, as if it was a, just a fictional novel sitting there. I want you to know today that the Bible is not a good luck charm. It's not a fictional novel of great stories that you once heard in Sunday school with felt boards and veggie tales. The Bible is, is not, it's not just some thing that, that is sitting there to be a, a rule book for your life. How many of you have, have approached this thinking, I don't know if I want to open the rule book today because of what I'm going to find. This is not a book of Rules for your life. Principles, yes. Commandments, yes. Things to live by if you want to stay in God's will, yes. But if you approach this like an ancient document that isn't relevant to our time, but because it says Holy Bible on it, it must be good luck. It must be something special so i just need to let it sit there it's never meant to sit on a shelf and collect dust somebody say it's alive you're gonna be like waking up in the middle of the night it didn't move it's not what i'm talking about it's alive hebrews let me read hebrews 4 hebrews 4 12 says this for the word of god is alive and active it's sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart for the word of god is alive and active uh, I had a pastor one day, we were coming out of a big bookstore called Books A Million in the U.S., huge bookstore, Books A Million for a name because there's millions of books in there. And he says, hey, Daniel, you know it's funny that we just walked out of Books A Million. There's a, book, there's a million books in there, but there's only one that's alive. They sold Bibles in there. There's only one that's alive. There's many authors out there. There's many books, but there's only one book that the words in it are living and active. 
And we have to understand this and capture this if we're ever going to engage with the Bible. The first thing I want you to know today is this, is the Bible is a place to meet God. The Bible is a place to meet God. If you would read through this, you'll, what you'll discover is, it's not Moses' story, not Noah's story, not Abraham's story. You'll see all that. But what it's meant to tell you is God's story all along. It is a book about his story. It's a, it is a, it's a book laying out the story of God, and if you would read and engage with it, what will happen is, is you'll begin to find your story in his story. You'll begin to find your story intertwined and interweaved in his story, and what you're going to engage with is the fact that he is shaping you and what he's done for you. It is his story, not just a historical fiction novel of Bible characters, but it's his story. I took, a, I took a Bible one time to, at, at youth group because you can do crazy things at youth group and nobody will judge you. And I, I took a Bible like this. Some of you are just going to judge me for telling you. And, um, and, and well, I'll just do it. I'll just do it in front of you. So I just, right there, that holds no value. That's what I did. And all the youth, <gasps> pastor. I said, until, until you pick it up and you open it and you read it because if this thing remains closed if you don't engage with the living word it will it will do nothing in your life it will hold no value in your life it will do nothing for you because you're not engaging with it it did nothing for me sitting on my bedside table it did nothing for me tucked away collecting dust it is the it is the words inside of it that are living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It's a meeting point with God. This place, so when I come here, my approach to opening the Bible should not be the same as if I'm reading a novel. Now it's time to read today. But my approach to reading his word should be I'm coming to meet with God. Because it's alive. When I read these words, they can, they can do something inside of me. They can transform my life because they're not dead words. They're alive. Even though they were written by, by, uh, through the Holy Spirit by men thousands of years ago, they're alive. And they're still transforming hearts today. They're still shaping lives today. They're still setting people free today. Some of you have maybe a framed Bible verse normally in your guest bathroom. This is how it works. And it just sits there. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Like who wants to read that when you're going to the toilet, you know? Just you're like I'm just ministering to all my guests. They come over. Those words are alive. Those words are alive because of what they'll do in your heart, what they'll do in people's lives. You see, in the beginning was the word. It was the very words of God in Genesis chapter 1 that he spoke, that created heaven and earth, created you and me, created everything that exists. His words are alive. In the beginning was the word. And it took breath, ruach, Holy Spirit to be able to speak it out. The Trinity was there at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. His words are alive. When I come here, I'm meeting with him. You need to make intentional time. Like put it on your Google calendar. Meeting with God, location, the Bible. And have intentional time where you spend with him. It is a meeting with him. Number two, God speaks through his Bible. God speaks through the Bible. God, God doesn't, listen, for, so, some of you have been maybe saying, and I do it all the time, God speak to me, Lord, speak. And sometimes I hear God say, I already spoke. I already spoke. And, he, and if I would just open up his word, on the words that have already been spoken to mankind, I would hear his voice. You hear his voice when you come to his word. 
when I meet with God, he begins to speak to me. Not just, it's not just, oh, that's a cool saying or that's a cool proverb. But he begins to speak. He begins, here, here's what began to happen. When I began to engage with God's word, I would come home every day and sit on a hammock outside of my double wide trailer that I rented with some roommates. I don't know why my, my accent went southern all of a sudden when I'd said double wide trailer. Probably because a song is in my head and that happens too often. I would sit out there in the hammock and I would read Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life and I would have the Bible and I'd, go, I'd be opening up. I would be looking at the Bible. I'd be reading the book. I'd be opening up the word. And what God began to do is he began to speak to me about who I was. You see, when you open up his word, he'll begin to speak to you about who he is in your life. And he'll begin to speak to you about who you are. You want to know who you are? You're going to find it in his word when he speaks to you. This will shape your identity. So many of us are looking for our identity to be shaped from outside sources. We're looking for our identity to be shaped by people's acceptance in our life, by our job, our career, by social media and what these people are doing. We're looking to be shaped, but I'm telling you, we have to come to God's word if we want to be shaped in our true destiny, our true identity. You will find it and he will speak to it through his word. You see, there's two, different, there's two different Greek words for word in the Bible, logos and rhema. Logos is the written word of God. It's what we find here in these pages, the written word of God, logos. This is the logos word. And some of us need to engage with it, but there's also something called a rhema word, which is a word spoken to you. And what, can, what will happen is, is if you engage with the logos word, then you will receive a rhema word. So you'll be reading a scripture maybe that you've been reading your whole life. Maybe you stumble upon Jeremiah 29, 11 that you've read a thousand times. Or maybe Genesis chapter one because that's where your New Year's resolution starts and ends and you're just like, I've just read that a lot. Genesis one, you know, it started in Genesis. It happens to me, okay? And You've, reading, you, you've read it a thousand times, but you read it, and all of a sudden, it, there's a revelation that takes place. It's a rhema word. God speaks to you right there in that moment. And he can do that when you engage with his logos, with the written word of God. You can, you can receive a rhema word. Here's an example of this. Um, Megan and I were praying about coming to Germany, and we were really wrestling back and forth. God, is this something you want us to do? We need a word. We need a word. And when we say, God, give us a word, we weren't just praying, but we were going to his word because maybe within it we can get a rhema word. And so God began to speak many things, but one of which we, I was reading through Isaiah one day. And I, say, and I came across Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. He said, it says this. It says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. And for you, that just sounds... Okay, that's awesome. It's a, nor it's a Bible verse. But for us in that moment, it was God saying to us, hey, Daniel, Megan, if you are willing and obedient, and all that was on my mind was Germany and you guys, if you're willing and obedient to go pastor some crazy people up in Germany, over in Germany, up and over, I don't know my latitudes and longitudes, if you would just be willing and obedient then you will eat the good things of the land and that was a promise we held on to when we were on a plane with tin boxes saying our life has just been uprooted and now we're flying we don't know half of anybody here except for the pictures of Simi that we got that said hey you're going to live with him for three months in his cellar you know I'm like okay if you're willing and obedient you see you can be reading through scripture and he can give you a rhema word for now that's why I'm encouraging you, man. I, I'm, I'm daring you. I'm daring you. Read his word this month. Read his word this series. Engage with it. Don't stop. Even if you read it, you're like, I have no idea what that said. And you put it away and you go off to work. Just engage with it. And we're going to give you the tools. Number three, and lastly, the Bible is relevant today. It's alive. It's not ancient. It's still living today. It's alive. Jesus resurrected from the dead. He's not still in a tomb, and he is the word. The word is alive, and it's still relevant today. We should not, 
We should not just use this as an historical document, but it is a guide for our life that is relevant today. He's still speaking to people through his word. It's the word of God that is transforming hearts, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. He's alive. The Bible is still relevant. The truths in this remain the same. The truths in this remain the same. Guys, we can't be, we can't be Christians that say, okay, I like what that promise is for my life, but when it comes to forgiving somebody, when Jesus tells his disciples, that's not relevant anymore to me because of what they did to me. It, no, 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 no. It's re- it was relevant then. It's relevant now. It's the truth. What you will find in this is truth. And I'm telling you, we live in a world where everybody's looking for truth. And everybody has their own truth. This is mine and this is yours and we've got, guys, we have got to get back to, there is one foundational truth and it's relevant today. It has cultural context that we can dive into and we can see the context for today. And we're going to teach you some of that throughout this series. But the truths that we find and the principles we find are still relevant today. And if you would read it and engage with it and and apply it to your life, you will see how fundamental it is. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Everything else will fade away, but it is the word of the Lord that endures forever. Listen, your prized possessions will fade away, but it is the word of the Lord that endures forever. Everything in life... One day, you're going you're gonna to be gone out of this world, and it's still the word of the Lord that remains. I want to be engaged with something that's that eternal. I want to be engaged with something that, is, that goes beyond me, that has come long before me and goes beyond me. It's alive. It lasts forever. It endures forever. It is the word of God. The Bible has not, not only will, but it has endured the test of time. It's endured the test of time. It's been tried by men who gave their lives to it. Men have given their lives to the calling in the word of God. Going to countries where if you bring this Bible into it, You're surely putting your life on the line, and many have died to do it. It's been tried by kings who have ruled by the words in this. It's been tried by it's been tried by time. Let me just share this with you. There's many there's many historical manuscripts out there that so many of us live our lives by. Let me just give you some of them and give you a picture of how fundamental that the word of God is. That this isn't just slapped together, it's not just thrown together, that it stood the test of time. So you might recognize some of these historical do- documents. Homer's Iliad, there's 643 manuscripts that, are, that have been discovered. Homer's Iliad, 643 manuscripts. And from the point of history that it was talking about to the earliest point of the the manuscript that was found, there's a gap of 500 years of where they found that it was written between the origin, when it happened, and the copies of the manuscripts they have. Aristotle, there's 49 copies of manuscripts. And there's a gap from the origin to the copies and manuscripts they have of 14,000, or sorry, 1,400 years. Aristotle. And these are things that you learn in school, no problem. These are historical things that you talk about all the time, no problem. Nobody's questioning it. Plato, seven copies, with 1,200 years between the origin and the copy. Now let me just tell you, the New Testament alone, the New Testament alone, has 5,600 copies of manuscripts with less than a hundred years in between the original copies found and the events taking place. Homer's Iliad is the next thing to the New Testament manuscripts with 643 copies compared to the manuscripts uh, of 5,600 copies found. And 
They're still finding them today. And when they compare 5,600 copies, there's a 99.5 textually, uh, textually pure. They're textually pure. 99.5%. So when they compare all of those copies and all those manuscripts, 99.5% pure the copies are. It's been, it has been tested by time. It's been tested by time. At this point in our history, there's not many people educated that would say these events did not exist. These manuscripts are not there. These, the New Testament especially was not. They, nobody will deny Jesus' ex existence. They just deny his divinity. It stood the test of times. It's been tried by science. There's more stuff coming out in science that proves what God's word already says. It blows my mind. It's even, been, it's even been tried by me, a crazy, what did I say, heathen. It's been tried by me because I was looking everywhere for my identity. I was looking everywhere for God. I didn't know I was looking for God, but I was looking for God. I was looking for myself in relationships. I was looking for him and a way out in friendships. I was so lost, yet this Bible sat right there on my bedside table. But you see, when I was 20 years old, I made a decision that I was going to follow Jesus. I made a decision that day, and Christine, you could come and play keys. We're going to close. I made a decision that I was going to go all in. Because what took place in my life was really Isaiah, where it says the grass withers and the flowers fade. Everything I had built my life on. If I told you the story, which some of you have heard it, if I told you the story, it's probably not that big of a deal. And even now I look back and the things that happened compared to maybe what I've been through since, it's not that big of a deal. But for me in that moment, the grass withers and the flower faded. Everything else, everything else was stripped away. And here I was in my double wide trailer and crying because I, I had nowhere else to go. And I give my life to the Lord in that moment and I... I had no perfect prayer, no, no pastor led me in a prayer, but I said, I said, God, I want to live for you. I don't know what that means. And then I went straight to this Bible that was sitting in my, in my bedside table. And I began to pick it up and read it. Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life that somebody a couple weeks later had given me at work. And I began to read. And as I began to read the living word, I didn't know it was living. I didn't actually know what it was doing, it, but it was like I was being sucked into his story and he was beginning to show me who I was. And then I went real nerdy and I got all these like tabs. You see all these tabs? Started marking in them and, and then I, put, I added these tabs and this used to be in, this, maybe some of you have them so you won't judge me, but zipper pouches with the highlighters. Went and got one of those. Going to church today. I got so excited about God's word. And it was only because it shaped my life. Because this wasn't going to just be a part of Christianity that, oh, I got to do this because this is part. But I fell in love with God's word because of what I saw it begin to do in my life. Because I decided to engage with it. Because I decided to open it up and engage with it. Can you stand to your feet with me today? And we're going to close. But my challenge to us is that we would just open this up and engage with it. First, you have to know that it's alive. It's alive. The words in here are living and active. And we want to help you get a Bible if you don't have a Bible. I've got links on the um, Amazon links that you can go purchase one today. You can hit the Buy Now button. We know you like the Buy Now button. And if you can't afford a Bible, I'll buy you one. Let me know. And we want you to begin to engage with his word. I just dare you over this next season to engage with it. See what, see what the word of God will do in your life, the living word of God will do in your life. You have to open it up and engage. Can you close your eyes with me today? Maybe you're in here today, maybe you're watching online, and you would say, you know, I want to engage with his word, but maybe, 
what you have to understand is the first step is a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship with Jesus. Because what you're doing when you read his word is, is you're engaging with Jesus because he is the living word. And so you need a relationship with Jesus. You've never made that decision maybe to say, Jesus be the Lord of my life. That decision that I made there in my trailer to say, Jesus, I'm all in. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm all in. I don't know what Leviticus means. I, don't, I haven't read this thing yet. I don't know what the Bible means, but I just know that I've tried other things and it's not working and I want you. I need you. I'm all in. If that's you today in the room, would you just lift a hand and say, that's me. Nobody's going to call you out. Just a hand and you can put it back down and say, that's me. I want to make that decision today. If you're watching online, we'll have a link that comes up for you to let us know and we can put some resources in your hand as well. God, today we just thank you that you are King of Kings and that the Word became flesh. If it wasn't for the Word that became flesh, we wouldn't have redemption and salvation. We wouldn't be able to have a relationship with you. So we're grateful for that. We're grateful today, Jesus. We're grateful that you didn't just leave us stranded here on earth without a living document, a living will to help guide us that you still speak to us and through it today and then when we speak it out when we apply it to our life things change we're grateful for the word of God that you've given us thankful for that I pray you empower us give us strength maybe to wake up in the morning and engage with this. Maybe it's waking up 10 minutes early. Just help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just tell you this um, before, you're, before we leave today. Um, just one practical tip. I'm gonna give you a practical tip every day, every week. You're gonna get one of how to engage with the Bible. The Bible's living and active. Here's your one practical tip. Before you sit down and read this or when you sit down and read this, I want you to pray first. Say, God, speak to me through your word today. I'm listening. If that's all you pray, God, speak to me through your word today. I'm listening. Because it's living, you're engaging with it, not just with your eyes and your mind. Speak to me through your word today. Pray before you read. Pray before you read. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a bonus tip. I'll give you a bonus tip. Here's a bonus tip. Don't start in Leviticus. If you're starting, don't start in Leviticus. I would encourage you to start, I'm just going to throw these out, John, start, start in John, the Gospel of John, or start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, start in the New Testament, or go to Psalms and Proverbs, start there. That's right in the middle, you can just, you know, open it up. The cool thing about Proverbs is, is there's 31 Proverbs, you can do one proverb, one chapter a day in Proverbs, and you'll be done in a month. So start, start with something you can engage with. And don't try to bite off too, too much. Don't try to read three chapters if you're just engaging with this thing for the first time. Pray before you read. Let me pray for you one last time and then Kelly's going to come close us out. Father, today we thank you again for your word. Help us when we open it up, meet us here. Meet us here. Meet us and engage with us. Speak to us. It would be like us coming to the garden where... We just, everything else is turned off. Everything else is shut off and we're just engaging with you. And we're meeting with you there. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give Jesus a hand clap of praise today?